you've joined Kolo with GrowingYourGreens.com today we have another exciting episode for you and it's now summer and it's time to really get my butt moving in the garden I kind of sat in my butt all day today inside working since it was like 109 maybe 110 degrees out today so I like to come out early in the morning or later in the evening to get all my gardening done anyways today's project is to start harvesting some of my beautiful collared leaves and other brassica family plants I think I got some collards and maybe some uh, broccoli and some uh, uh, Brussels sprouts and some maybe some cabbage or something I don't know all different kinds of brassicas left over from my winter garden and these have just continued to grow and I haven't really like pulled them or anything this one over here if you guys could look went to flower so I'm letting it go to seed and that's cool but I have a lot of these guys still have greens on them and I'm going to continue to Keep, let them grow until they go to flower until they're no longer productive for me even though I could be replacing this with some um, more important summer vegetables luckily enough some some summer vegetables have come up on their own including all down below I don't know if you guys can see that down there but it's all Malvar spinach that's growing so by the time these guys come out the Malvar spinach will probably be big and I have some beautiful Swiss chard in the back that I've been harvesting for juicing uh, the collard greens these days are getting a bit strong for juicing, so we're going to turn them into kale chips, or uh, in this case, collard chips. Now you could make these chips that I'll be demonstrating for you guys in this episode with any kind of edible leafy greens, from stinging nettles to sorrel to Swiss chard to collard greens to arugula, even lettuce. I mean, any leafy green that's edible, you could do it with like Egyptian spinach, Malabar spinach, you could do it with the um, uh, lamb's quarters, anything, right? We're going to turn those into some delicious uh, leafy green chips. <laughs> and then you could be able to eat those so they're coming out of your garden instead of eating something that's really high fat and high salt, uh, such as potato chips, which I know a lot of you guys are still eating. So I want you guys to eat leafy green chips out of your garden instead of potato chips. So I guess it's getting dark here pretty soon, so we're going to go ahead and start to harvest. What I like to do when I harvest my uh, plants for uh, chips is harvest the bottom leaves. So some of these guys are damaged, you know, they got holes. I had some uh, caterpillars attacking my stuff here, and I wasn't entirely on it 100%. So, you know, they left some of my plants with um, Swiss cheese. <laughs> Swiss cheese uh, collard leaves but yeah the easiest way I found to get them off is to take the plant and shake it and when you shake it uh, you know you shake it hard enough it's kind of like an earthquake in a building and all the people are gonna fall off <laughs> while well, the caterpillars are gonna fall off they're gonna fall on the ground and then you could see them on the ground and they're gonna like you know be like moving and then you could like see them with your x-ray vision and uh, and snuff them out <laughs> yeah or do with them what you will but yeah, so I'm harvesting all the bottom leaves, which are basically going to just dry up and fall off anyways. And I'm going to harvest, uh, you know, uh, some of the more damaged leaves that have a lot of holes. My uh, leafy green chips are not going to care. So I guess I'm going to get out here and start harvesting a bunch before it gets dark. And then we're going to come at, back at you inside and show you guys how to make these uh, delicious and easy uh, leafy green vegetable chips. So now I'm inside and I got the greens washed and I, I took the stems off and then I chopped them up into little pieces so we have a nice large bowl of the leafy greens. Now this could be turned into a salad but we're going to turn this into something even better than a salad. We're going to turn it into collard green chips or leafy green chips. So you'll need a few things to do this task besides the greens that we harvested. We're going to need some other appliances and um, ingredients today, and let me go over those. So to make the leafy green vegetable chips, you should use a dehydrator. I have an Excalibur 10 tray stainless steel dehydrator. This is probably the top of line dehydrator. You guys probably don't need to buy this one. It'll set you back a pretty penny. I do need to let you guys know that I do sell dehydrators for a living and if you guys are interested in buying a dehydrator or a blender or a juicer for that matter, please visit my website at discountjuicers.com and support me. That allows me to continue to make these gardening videos as well as all the other educational videos that I make on YouTube for you guys. 
And that's at discountjuices.com, and I have a YouTube channel associated with that, youtube.com slash raw foods, where I have uh, you know videos on the, uh, the review of this dehydrator, also about blenders, and also about the juicers. Now, if you don't have a dehydrator and you don't want to spend, this one's literally $1,000 <laughs> to get a dehydrator, you could get a less expensive dehydrator. So the one I would recommend for like the low budget person that doesn't want to spend a lot of money but wants to make some healthy dehydrated foods, and the dehydration is one of my favorite ways to you know dehydrate, uh, for example, tomatoes for my garden, as well as the chips that we're doing today, and also just leafy, plain leafy greens to make your own green powders. Uh, I recommend the Samson uh, dehydrator. So that's uh, a little bit over $100. And that's a really good unit with the digital controls. If you want to take a step up, then I'd go for the Excalibur uh, 3948. That's the Excalibur with the digital controls. I'll put links in the description down below. And of course, if you want to get the one I got, <laughs> I'll put a link down there for that one as well. This one's uh, commercial certified, so it's NSF certified for use in restaurants and um, if you want to like package up your kale chips and you have a farm, this is the machine you're going to want to get since it meets the health code standards. And I want to encourage you guys, if you guys have a farm and are growing for sale, I want to encourage you guys, guys besides just growing the food itself and selling the food, you want to do value added things. So you could turn your kale that you could you know, sell for a dollar, a couple of dollars a bunch to like literally making kale chips or making vegetable chips like I'm sharing with you guys today and now charging, you know, five dollars for two ounces and to be able to sell them effectively, give out samples because once people try these things, <laughs> they're going to buy them, right? So yeah, it does take a little bit more labor, but you're going to incrementally increase your revenue. Same thing with, you know, taking your cabbage that you could sell for 50 cents to a dollar a pound turning it into sauerkraut and then now that sauerkraut is selling for you know six to ten dollars a jar depending on the recipe and well, where you're selling it at so yeah those are the dehydrators so if you don't have a dehydrator and you don't want to buy one that's all right too you don't really need it i like the dehydrator because it, it allows you to precisely set the temperature you want to dehydrate the food at so for me personally I like to dehydrate uh, my food at about 105 to 111 degrees. So this uh, preserves the most amount of enzymes and uh, you know slowly dries and dehydrates, just ba basically evaporates off the water. And once you evaporate off the water, the food's not gonna spoil as quickly. And some dehydrated foods in an airtight container, I like to use mason jars. I don't like to use plastic bags so much, but the food will store for easily a year maybe even longer, you know, if you got those little gel pack things that take out all the oxygen removers. So that's really cool. But if you don't have a dehydrator, you can do it at a hotter temperature. Um, if you have like an oven, like with a gas pilot light, you can just barely turn the pilot light on and it'll get it, you know, a little bit warm. Or if you have an electric uh, oven, maybe you could like crank it up to 200 degrees or like the lowest. You could kind of, you'd be baking them really at that point instead of dehydrating them. But it's going to be pretty similar, right? The thing you could do is you could like, uh, you know, turn the oven on, lowest setting, and then leave the door open. You know, it's going to waste a lot more electricity than a dehydrator would because a dehydrator doesn't have to like make it that hot, right? And so these guys are very efficient and really don't cost that much to run. So yeah, the right tool for that job is what my grandfather told me. So yeah, get a dehydrator if you really are serious about this and, and putting up some of your uh, fresh foods like you know, I like to draw my dehydrate my peppers and tomatoes and greens into green powders and of course make these leafy green chips. Now the other appliance you'll need is a blender. That's what we're going to do to basically make the uh, dressing that we're going to put on the chips and then we're going to dehydrate that. So the blender is imperative in my kitchen. You know, I probably use my juicer the most, then I use the blender and then I use the dehydrator. I use a dehydrator when I have overabundance of food in my garden that I'm not fermenting. You know, I'll uh, dehydrate it as a secondary choice. But the blender for this recipe, uh, you know, you could use any blender. You want to blend the liquid stuff up first and then add a few nuts at a time. Don't just like dump all the nuts in like I'm going to do. Otherwise, it's going to leave chunks and that's not cool. But yeah, I like to use the Vitamix. My favorite one is the Vitamix 7500 model. And if that one's a bit too spendy for you, go for the Vitamix Turbo Blend VS. That's what I'm using here. 
and I have the model with a 48 ounce carafe instead of a 64 ounce. I find things blend a little better. But the 7500 model, which I'll also put a link down below, um, has a 64 ounce carafe that's short and fat, so it works even better than this model. So yeah, so those are the appliances you'll need, and then the only other things you'll need are the ingredients for the dressing that we're going to make and put on the chips. So let me go over the ingredients for that. So here we have a one and a half pound of mostly cherry tomatoes and Roma tomatoes from my garden. And you're going to need a lot of tomatoes and it's tomato season. So what better way to, you know, eat your tomatoes and to dehydrate those on to your vest, on your kale or collard greens in this uh, instance. Uh, next, we're going to use uh, some apple cider vinegar. This is raw unfiltered apple cider vinegar. Just a splash in there to get that acid taste. So it's going to re be really good. Then we got some uh, bulk taco seasoning. I usually like to get the uh, Star West Botanicals or the Frontier brand organic taco seasoning. It goes into a lot of recipes I make. I really love it a lot. We got a couple other things from my garden. We got uh, three small onions that I grew as well as about a dozen uh, different hot peppers, just ripe ones that I picked. These are all fresh, just picked just now. I also have some sauerkraut that I made. Um, from the winter, I think I have a video of how I made this stuff, and I'll put a link, uh, actually I don't have a video of this stuff, I have a video of how I did my radishes. Um, but yeah, sauerkraut, definitely good stuff, and another way you could incorporate more of the food you grew into what you're eating, right? Next, we got about a heaping cup full of my, one of my favorite nuts in the world, these are macadamia nuts, so this will give our dressing a nice creamy consistency without the use of any kind of dairy products that is really not necessary for us to eat. There's no nutrient in dairy that we can't get from other foods on the planet. Uh, next we have about a heaping cup of sun-dried tomatoes that I dehydrated, probably even in this uh, Excalibur dehydrator. And then uh, finally what we have here some uh, non-GMO organic whole soybean miso. So this has uh, some level of salt, plus it's another fermented food to add a special flavor uh, to the dressing we're making known as um umami. And uh, this will really light up your taste buds and make your kale chips or collard chips or vegetable chips taste really great. So that's pretty much it. Um, I guess the next step is let's just do this. So basically all these ingredients are going to basically make a salad dressing. So say you harvested all this and you didn't want to dehydrate it, you want to eat it fresh or you want to serve it to people coming over for a dinner party at your house, blend all this stuff up, pour it in like we're going to do and then just serve it fresh. Now eating you know, collard greens and kale, especially this time of year when it's summer and the weather's hotter, they get a lot more strong tasting so this would not be my first choice to feed to guests because they may not be used to it. I'm used to it and that's not a problem for me. But I know many people are like sensitive to strong flavors and they want weak, mild greens. So in that instance, what you'd want to do in the summertime is grow something like uh, longevity spinach, malbar spinach, or Egyptian spinach. These are much more mild greens to serve on a salad uh, for the summer. And of course, if you're in the fall, winter, or spring, grow some lettuce. That's really vile. All right, so first step is we're gonna go ahead and dump all the tomatoes into the blender one and a half uh, pounds and then we're just going to go ahead and uh, pulse this guy up just to get it to blend down because it's like taking up a lot of airspace. All right, so we got that all blended up there. Next we're going to add our other ingredients, so we're just going to go ahead and put some apple cider vinegar in. I'm really bad at measuring things, I'm sorry for those of you guys that are trying to duplicate my recipe exactly. I'll let you guys know that my recipes are never exact. <laughs> you know, I, I measured this stuff out for you guys today, but normally man, I put this handful of that, a handful of this, and you know, a whole shake of this, and it's cool, I like this because it comes out different every single time, right? We need to get out of this like... Oh, it's got to be exact, right? I mean, I'm half German and half Chinese, but this is not exact, man. All right. So anyways, I don't know, man. If you want to know exactly, I don't know, I put a tailspoon or two of this stuff in there. I just dumped it in. And then, uh, let's see, after that, we're going to go ahead. We got the three small onions. Uh, these are sweet onions, so they're not like the hot onions. 
And then uh, these are mixture of peppers. Uh, probably got some um, pepper cheese mostly and some other hot peppers. I don't know what kind they are, but they're going in seeds and all. <laughs> Let's see, those are two things. Then next we're gonna we got the sauerkraut from my garden. Man, I love to smell this stuff. Woo! Let's see, how much of this stuff did we put in? I put in that much. <laughs> I don't know, maybe call that like three tablespoons? Maybe four, I don't know, whatever. Actually, these aren't tablespoons, these are forks, fork bowls. Fork spoons. Fork bowls, I don't know, whatever. All right, so we got the sauerkraut in there now. Next, we're gonna go ahead and put in that taco seasoning here. On that, I don't know, I'd estimate like, uh, I don't know, one tablespoon. Maybe one and a half. <laughs> Depending on how taco you like it. Now, you don't need to use this exact recipe, right? You could use any kind of nuts. You could use bell peppers if you don't got tomatoes. You know, I've used orange juice instead of uh, tomatoes. If I don't have tomatoes, you know, I mean, those are some kind of good fruits to use, like orange juice, peppers, or tomatoes, are usually make a pretty good base. Next, we're going to go ahead and add some nuts. Now, I want to stop at this point and, and talk more about the nuts, right? Like, in this recipe, I got different flavor sensations going on, so it's going to taste good for average people. Like, even my brother, he loves these things, right? But I, I love them even more, especially when I grew them myself out of my garden. And many people making kale chips or vegetable chips might just use like some salt, some oil, and the greens, which you guys are free to do. I'm never going to tell you guys what you should or shouldn't do. Those are like easy, and I would call them kind of like lame kale chips because they really light up your taste buds because we, our taste buds are lit up when we get, you know, highly concentrated sources of fat and salt. And as much as people think those things may be healthy, right, salt in excess is never healthy. Right, we need to get an adequate amount of sodium in our diets, not necessarily salt. And so I don't like to use salt in any major excess. There is some salt in the miso, and I did use some salt in creation of the sauerkraut, but it's not nearly as much as actually dumping salt in there because these are salt in small quantities in each of these ingredients that are going to add flavor. But besides just the salt, I'm trying to add other flavors besides just a salty flavor. I'm trying to add that umami flavor, right? I'm adding, you know, uh, some of the ingredients from my garden that's grown high quality, you know, uh, minerals in the soil. Not only the sea minerals that I spray on, but also the rock dust minerals in the soil. So that's going to give my food better flavor without having to add the salt. Uh, so that's the salt component. Now for the fat component, like people think, oh, olive oil, John, that's healthy, or all these different oils, coconut oil, that's healthy, like, I want to let you guys know that, you know, in my personal opinion, you know, oils are just another processed foods, and I want you guys to get processed foods out of your diet, right, if it comes in a packaged bottle or jar, right, if it needs an ingredient label so you know what it is, what is that oil in there, you wouldn't know if there was a label on there, um, I want you guys to get it out of your diet, because once man starts processing things, and factories, and all these things, it's really like subverting nature and it's trying to do different, it's like using chemical fertilizers on your garden when you're trying to grow organic and try to use compost and, and the natural method. The natural method is for us to eat whole foods, not, you know, extracted processed foods. And a lot of those olive oils, unfortunately, aren't, even though they say 100% olive oil, are not because they're doctoring it up with other crappy oils. So you're really not getting what you're paying for. And so one tablespoon of olive oil is like 120 calories. For that same amount of calories, I, don't, I think you could eat like 45 olives, like whole olives. So instead of eating olive oil, I would eat whole olives because not only do you get the oil in the olives, you get the fiber, you get more phytochemicals and phytonutrients, vitamins and minerals that are not in the 100% extracted fat. And the processed foods, including oils, in my opinion, is one of the reasons why People are overweight in this day and age because you might make a salad, you pour, pour an oil and vinegar dressing on there and people don't realize that they got more calories from the oil and vinegar dressing than they do in the salad greens. Yes, and even if it's this large because the leafy greens are only about 100 calories per pound 
right? So you can eat a pound of greens or one tablespoon of oil on that, and normally people put more than a tablespoon of oil on their salad. Now you got more calories coming from the oil than the salad greens. So in the nuts, you know, there are much lesser concentration of calories, although there's still more than lettuce. And besides just having the fat, they also have the phytonutrients, phytochemicals, stanols and sterols and um, vitamins and minerals, you know, that nature would provide. And one day I will have my own macadamia nut tree <laughs> to have my own nuts. Now, it, for this recipe, we're using macadamia nuts because it makes a nice creamy consistency, really neutral flavor. But of course, use any nuts you guys could get your hands on, right? If you guys have a walnut tree, use walnuts. If you got a pecan tree, use pecans. If you got a pistachio tree, use pistachios, right? They'll all work. I just like the macadamia nuts. And I also try to encourage you guys to rotate the nuts you eat. Don't always eat macadamia nuts. We want to get some of the nutrition that's in pine nuts, for instance. But this is what I'm using today, and I want to encourage you guys to use uh, whole food sources of uh, fat. So we got uh, one cup of the macadamia nuts. Maybe we're going to blend this up to get it down a little bit. All right, we almost got a full blender craft, right? Then we got one cup of the tomatoes that I dehydrated myself. We're going to pour that in there. And then finally, the last ingredient we have today is our miso. So for those of you guys who don't know what miso is, or those of you guys that are Asian out there probably know what miso is, but a lot of you guys don't know what miso is. But basically, it's like cabbage is to sauerkraut what you know whole cooked soybeans are to miso. They basically uh, cook the soybeans, they inoculate it, and then they let it ferment. You know, depending on the kind, they, this is a Kyoto red, this is a low sodium kind, um, they also have a white and a yellow and different kinds of misos. And man, this stuff is amazing. It, it, it tastes like nothing else, but if you if, you, if, if you had never tasted it before, it tastes as close as to like soy sauce, right? But yeah, it has a nice, uh, a little bit salty flavor. Once again, this is the low salt version that I like to get. And also it has the, the benefits of the probiotics and the beneficial microbes in there. And it adds some taste sensation aside from just adding the sodium, you know, which is an important nutrient, but we don't want to get too much. And too many people, unfortunately, just rely on salt for flavor, which they should be relying on high quality food, like the stuff I'm growing in my garden that's like in the tomatoes, the onions, the peppers, and of course the greens. I want to encourage, you know, and the sauerkraut, of course. I want to encourage you guys to use as many ingredients as you guys can source out of your garden. And even if this, you can't make this exact recipe, if you got, you know, leeks instead of onions, use the leeks in this recipe. Or you got garlic instead of onions, use some garlic in there, right? I just happen to have the onions in there out of my garden. So that's what I'm using this time. But like, nothing's ever like fluid or set in stone, right? I want you guys to experiment and have fun in the kitchen. Worst case is you're gonna make a batch and it's not gonna taste good. But if you stick with what I do and maybe change one or two things up a little bit and just a little bit, it's going to turn out fine. And it's going to be new taste sensations, right? And it's just fun playing in the kitchen. All right, so once we got all these items in there, we're just going to go ahead and blast this blender on high. That's why I like the Vitamix. It has sharp blades. It really fractionates, cuts up those big pieces of nuts, and turns it into a cream sauce. So uh, tomatoes, you're going to get creamed. Right, so run it along enough until you smell the motor working really hard and it's kind of burning because this is a really thick mixture and it's challenging for even the Vitamix to blend up. To make it a little bit thinner, if you don't want it this thick, I like it really thick because um, it's going to be more flavorful in the end product. You could reduce the amount of nuts and or reduce the amount of the uh, dried tomatoes that I use. So use like half cup and half cup instead of one cup and one cup. And if you have a non-powerful blender, uh, blend up all the ingredients, liquid first, and the last two, the nuts and the sun-dried tomatoes. You know, have your blender running, take off the little spout lid and like drop in like one nut at a time until it blows it up and fractionates it and then put in another one like one at a time. If you put all of them in at once, it's gonna leave like big chunks in a underpowered blender. All right, so we have that ready and look at that, it's really nice and thick. 
nice cream sauce. It's like, uh, you know, kind of a thick yogurt consistency. I'm going to go ahead and scoop out the stuff in the top here. Yeah, really nice consistency. That's why the Vitamix rules, man. Like, really no other blender gets it this fine in consistency. I've tested the Blendtec and other things, and they just don't really work as well as the uh, Vitamix here. All right, so next what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and take our bowl of kale and we're going to go ahead and take our dressing and this could be used this is a perfect dressing for a salad dressing I mean look at this nice thick consistency this would be like a, a, a salad dressing I'd make for dinner at night right I would have a bowl of greens and my salad dressing made out of ingredients mostly from my garden and if you don't want to eat it fresh you don't have to you can dehydrate it and if you make too much salad you can't eat it all uh, mix it all up and dehydrate the rest, right? And then eat it later. I like to take uh, these dehydrated collard chips uh, when I travel, for instance, right? And here's another cool thing, right? If you get tired of eating salads, you can make what's called a um, dehydrated salad. So instead of making chips where you dehydrate it fully, like uh, 12 to 18 hours in your dehydrator, you could dehydrate this for five hours and it dehydrates just enough to like get these leaves to like reduce down a little bit it basically takes out some of the water content of this dressing and it concentrates the flavors and it's even more delicious so yeah I mean, so many different things you do and you know I'm, I'm sharing with this recipe with you guys because I mean this is how I eat like I only prepare my food in certain ways like I don't fry my food for example you know that's that's highly uh, toxic and it creates free radicals and really damages the food. So I like to process the food that I eat, you know, with a low or no heat actually, like I'm doing today. So let's see, we're just gonna go ahead and scoop out the rest of this mixture and then we're gonna go ahead and uh, mix this guy up. All right, so I got all the delicious dressing goodness out of my blender carafe. Next step is we got a pair of stainless steel tongs. I got these on clearance after barbecue season, <laughs> pack of two. This is at like the Home Depot. These are never used for barbecue in my house. They're used for tossing off. I mean, tossing my salad. <laughs> All right, so let's toss off my salad here. And all we're going to do is really we're just trying to get the um, dressing mixed in and every leaf coated. And uh, let's keep it in the bowl, please. All right, so I've tossed my salad. <laughs> It's all mixed pretty good. The next step is to get it all set up in a dehydrator. So we got this stainless steel dehydrator and it's really nice. It comes actually with stainless steel trays because I know a lot of you guys are paranoid about putting your food on plastic. Uh, that being said, stainless steel trays, as I've learned, have their pros and cons. They're cool because they're stainless steel. They're indestructible. They're going to last a lifetime. They're highly resistant to rust. Um, but the negative thing is if I was to put these uh, kale chips on the stainless steel tray, oh, it hit it. <laughs> um, these guys are a, um, a witch to uh, clean. And instead of the W in witch, change that to a B. I'm not gonna say that today. <laughs> Anyways, they're a pain of the, you know what, to clean once you get the, the dressing of the kale chips on there. And even if you're just dehydrating, cut up slices of tomatoes on here, right? The tomatoes stick to the stainless steel grid. Now maybe if you sprayed it with some kind of oil or something like that, it wouldn't stick, but I don't like to coat oil on this stuff because even cleaning that stuff off is going to be a pain in the butt. So, you know, using the plastic trays that come with many dehydrators, they have plastic mesh tray that kind of just comes off. Those are really cool because those uh, uh, release a lot easier on the kale chips. Uh, that being said, because I've had to clean these one too many times, which is about two times, um, I don't dehydrate on those directly anymore. What I use instead are these guys. And uh, what I have in the bottom of my dehydrator, I have these uh, pre-cut already. And I kind of just uh, leave them in here, ready for me. And uh, what I got here is I got uh, parchment paper. So this is uh, parchment paper with uh, silicone on there. And uh, these are non-stick. So, um, on sun-dried tomatoes, they release like 98%, so it's very efficient at releasing, and on the kale chips, they release quite well. 
And the cool thing about the parchment paper, it comes in about a 15 inch width, which is the same size as the tray. So you just have to cut them on uh, two sides to make it the right size for your tray. And I get a couple uses out of them. So I might be able to use them maybe like three, four times before they get kind of too flaky. And then basically what happens to these guys is I put them through my paper shredder, I shred them up, and then they go in my composter, right? So they're getting 100% utilization on site. We're going to go ahead and stick our tray right there on top of the uh, Vitamix. That makes a nice little stand uh, there. I don't know if you guys can see that. Maybe I'll move it over for you guys. Make sure I'm centered up. And then all we're going to do is we're going to go ahead, just like we're scooping out our salad, uh, for a, scooping it out, you know, to put it in our bowl. We're just going to go ahead and take like not too much at a time. We're going to take a few things and we're just going to put it on the tray. And we don't want to like pile it up really high. We want to try to like have a single layer thin at most like two, two layers thin. I mean, if you can't get it right, maybe three, but you don't want to like jam it in there. You want to leave uh, plenty of air space so that when you're dehydrating it, um, the air could go everywhere and get it dehydrated perfect. So yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, fill this tray up and we'll come back at you when I'm all done. Alright, so I think I got about the whole tray finished, all lined up. We're going to go ahead and go around and show you guys what it looks like. And this is what it looks like on the tray. Then we're just going to go ahead and slide this in the dehydrator. Sometimes if it's too tall, I'll skip a tray. I'll take like a you know, tray out and then I'll put this in so we don't like mess up the top of my tray or hit it or maybe I'll just put it like this sometimes it's a little bit too tall so once we do that we got the next tray and we got the pre-cut parchment paper and we're just gonna go ahead and load this tray up too alright so we got this tray loaded up let's go ahead and uh, put this in the dehydrator so this is why buying a large dehydrator is quite critical if you are into preserving your own foods. As much as like it's 10 trays for this one, although when they shipped it to me they only shipped me 9 trays and I'm still trying to get that extra tray from them, the scumbags. Um, <laughs> uh, a, lo a lot of kale uh, spreads out uh, to cover a lot of surface area because you know when you're doing like tomatoes you're only supposed to cut the tomatoes into like I don't know, quarter inch pieces and like put one piece next to each, each other. So really it takes a lot of space to lay everything out properly to dehydrate it. And same thing, you know, we have, we had a lot of leafy greens and the surface area of the leafy greens were huge. So we want to like try to like layer this down like, you know, a single file or one up. I mean, I'm probably getting like sometimes maybe three up or four up because all these pieces are stick together. And that's all right, but we just don't want it too high and we don't want to like smash like 10 pieces on top of each other we want to leave nice uh leave it nice and fluffy and leave air space so that the air could get in there and dehydrate because that's how really uh, this is working now i want to stop for a second and talk to you more about the power of the leafy greens as you guys may be aware my youtube channel is actually called growing your greens and as much as i teach you guys about gardening and growing all kinds of foods in your garden from fruits and vegetables and herbs and even medicinal herbs um, you know greens is what I think are the most important foods on the planet and this is documented and confirmed by nutritional science these days right they are discovering every day it seems new beneficial compounds in the leafy greens and everybody tells us the government you know and everybody tells us to eat more fruits and vegetables and especially the leafy greens. Like, I believe America has an extreme uh, leafy green deficiency. And that's why my YouTube channel is called Growing Your Greens, to really highlight the benefits and the importance of the leafy greens. So I'm really glad that I could make this video share with you guys just one of the ways I use my leafy greens. Of course, another way is uh, through fermentation, like I have here. I also uh, juice them, which I have videos on juicing leafy greens. And I also blend them up. And of course I make salads with them and also add them to soups. Actually, I don't think I have a good soup recipe on this channel. Oh yeah, I did. I have one with my girlfriend. But yeah, if you're interested in other recipes and demos that I make on this channel, be sure to uh, 
go to my uh, youtube.com slash growing your greens and then I have a whole playlist with all different recipe videos that I've made over the years on how I use the food. You know, there's so many different beneficial phytonutrients and phytochemicals, vitamins and minerals in these leafy greens. For example, the leafy greens we're dehydrating today, these are anti-cancer, man. My uncle was just diagnosed with uh, colon cancer and maybe that could have been uh, prevented potentially if he was eating a lot of uh, anti-cancer leafy greens and other anti-cancer foods such as the onions that I added today and the garlic is also another anti-cancer food and also eating you know copious amounts of fiber that's going to keep things kind of going through you <laughs> in your colon and uh, you know the fiber acts as a broom to keep your colon clean but yeah the, the greens are essential and America has a leafy green deficiency in my opinion and it's my goal every day to eat two pounds of leafy greens you know whether that's in dehydrated uh, chips, vegetable chips, leafy green vegetable chips like I'm doing today whether that means I'm juicing a pound of greens like I did the other day whether that means I'm eating a pound of greens for my dinner today I had 10 ounces of greens blended up into the blender into a blended salad actually I don't think I have a good video on this channel about blended salads um, you know that's my goal and I want you guys to get as much leafy greens in as you guys can and more importantly grow those all times of year in your garden I know summertime you know you guys you know get into like growing all the tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers and eggplants and okra and all the cool summer crops but there are delicious leafy greens you guys can grow and I want you guys to grow those grow leafy greens and get them into you each and every day of the year this time of year in my garden even though it's been in the 100 degree weather lately, I got stinging nettles in my garden, I got lamb's quarters in my garden, I got purrs laying in my garden, I got Swiss chard in my garden, I got all these uh, collard greens, I got tree collards, I got dinosaur kale, I think I said Swiss chard, I got my Malabar spinach coming up, I just planted Egyptian spinach, even the 100 degree weather is just starting to come out and pop out the ground, so I'll be having that really soon. I got other uh, leafy greens also, such as the, uh, what is it, uh, wakate, no it's not wakate, it's um, papalo coming up. Um, oh, I got the genera procumbens, the ashitaba, you know, and hopefully pretty soon I'll be having uh, also katuk and the Okinawan spinach, right? Lots of different leafy greens, but you just got to find the right ones that are going to work in your particular climate. Another one that does quite well for many people is the New Zealand spinach, another excellent, you know, hot weather summer leafy green if you can't grow some of those uh, cooler leafy greens. All right, well, I got this tray loaded up. Let's go ahead and load up the dehydrator. And I think I got maybe one or more, one or uh, two more trays. We're gonna go ahead and do this off camera and we're gonna come back at you uh, when I'm done to show you guys how to set up and program the dehydrator. All right, so it looks like I got four full trays and about uh, a half of a, the last tray. So we're just gonna go ahead and use my spatula here and spatula off all the rest of this delicious dressing onto this last tray so it's going to be extra thick and then uh, let's see here then we're just going to go ahead and uh, set the dehydrator up now I was thinking about it and I, I want to also let you guys know that you know the reason why vegetables are so important to me is not only the nutrition contained within them but because they have those powerful plant compounds that are anti-disease so anti-cancer and basically you know if you like made arugula chips right the same time you're making the arugula chips or beet green chips, those guys are going to clean out your arteries, you know. And there's documented scientific studies on this topic. And yeah, big leafy green deficiency in the society. So yeah, grow leafy greens all the time. Here. All right, we got the last one all finished. We're just going to go ahead and uh, shove this in the dehydrator. Then we're going to go ahead and get dehydrated. All right, so we're just going to go ahead and push that tray in there and uh, close these two doors. These doors are nice and glass doors. Probably could clean them. <laughs> and then we're going to go ahead and set this dehydrator up. So this dehydrator has a cool feature. It's known as two time, two temperature. Normally a dehydrator you can set for, you know, one temperature, like the old school ones have like a TV, you know, volume knob, which are kind of lame. I definitely like the computer control ones, so they're more, much more precise. So that's what I recommend to you guys if you guys are looking to buy one. And uh, what we're going to do is, we're, if, I, if it only had one temperature that I could set it at, I would set it at 
uh, depending if it's in a digital model, maybe to like 111 on the Excalibur digital models. On the Excalibur analog models, I would set it to like 105 um, because there's a fluctuation of maybe like uh, 10 degrees or maybe 6 or 7 degrees on this model. So I don't want the temperature to exceed 118 degrees, which is what many people say enzymes start to degrade at. So I want to keep the most amount of enzymes in my food when dehydrating. So uh, if, because this has two time to temperature, and the thing is this, we could run the dehydrator for the first maybe like two hours at like 130 degrees or 140 degrees, and then after the first hour or two, then drop the temperature down to 111 degrees like I'd like. You might be thinking, John, that's too hot, man. You're going to kill all the enzymes. Well, here's the thing. When you're dehydrating the first hour or two, especially on our nice, nice liquid uh, dressing that's like mostly tomatoes, like a pound and a half tomatoes, or you're just dehydrating tomatoes, because there's so much water content in there, the dehydrator at 140 degrees is going to basically evaporate off the water first off there, and that's going to have a cooling effect on the food, so the food won't actually get to that temperature, right? Then after the first two, maybe three hours, then we drop the temperature down and then let it dehydrate the rest of the way at 111 degrees in this particular unit. So what this does, it effectively shaves hours off our dehydration time because we could do it in the beginning for a much uh, warmer temperature to, to evaporate off the larger percentage of water content first and then drop our temperature down. So let's go ahead and set this up. So let's see here. Uh, temperature number one. Temperature number one, we're going to go ahead and set here to, uh, you know, when we do a 133, and we're going to go ahead and set that up for a total of, uh, when we do three, oh, three hours today. All right, then we're going to go ahead and temperature two, we're going to go ahead and set the temperature two to 111. And we're just going to go ahead and crank the hours up all the way to like, um, I don't know, we're cranking up to like 32 hours. Although maybe I'll crank, I'll crank it up to maybe 30 hours, make it even number. Now we probably don't need to dehydrate this for a full 30 hours. You know, this depends on where you live, you know, and how thick your dressing is. You know, if it's, if you live in an arid climate, a humid climate, you know, if it's colder outside, it's hotter outside, you keep your house really cold, you keep your house warm, that's going to change the time. But in general, it takes from, it takes me personally, depending on when I want to eat it. If I'm going to eat it fresh, it doesn't have to be fully dried, but if I'm going to store it, I want it all the way dried. The lower the moisture content, the better it's going to store without molding. If you pull out things too early and try to store it and it's still too wet, it's going to mold on you. Then all your hard work is going to go down the toilet, so that's not too fun. So uh, we're going to go ahead and start it off at 30 hours at the start button. The fan starts up and it starts to heat. Let's go ahead and make sure our heating element's working. <laughs> all right, I feel the heat. The heat is on. <laughs> So I'm just going to go ahead and let this run. We'll come back at you tomorrow and uh, let you guys know the progress. And I'll pull them out when they're done and show you guys what we got. All right. Now I'm back. And it's been, I don't know, about 18 hours. Let's see. I put the timer went to 30 hours even. And it looks like on here we have uh, 12 hours and 45 minutes left. So that means it's been running, I don't know, 17 hours and 45 minutes or something like that. And I think it's done. Actually, I kind of know it's probably done because probably about after about 12 hours, I opened up the dehydrator, tried some of the chips. Most of them were dry, but some of the ones that I laid it on pretty thick were not yet dry. And uh, <laughs> I went ahead and ate two of the trays. So that was like uh, maybe like 30 to 40, 35% of the kale chips that I made, or the collard chips, they're gone. They're my stomach, man. That was my lunch today. <laughs> and they're delicious. Anyways, I think we're gonna go ahead and hit stop here on the unit, and we're just gonna go ahead and open this up. And we're going to show you guys what happened to our leafy green chips overnight. All right, let's take this guy out. So this is what happened. 
to our leafy green chips, if you guys can see that. Uh, let's see. They're basically just uh, dehydrated into like little pieces. And if we take it, mm, that was quite good. Reminds me of a. Uh, if you ever had pasta that had like a Mexican seasoning on it, that's kind of what it reminds me of. You can barely even taste the greens. These greens now, mind you, because it's the summertime, especially the brassica family plants in the desert in excess of 100 degrees, kind of taste a bit stronger. But the dehydration process killed that bite, so it's actually quite delicious. But yeah, the thing with the kale chips or the collard chips, right? In the store, two ounces of these will run you guys like $5.99, $4.99 on sale. But if you guys are growing your own stuff, you could literally make unlimited kale and collard chips. And if this is too much work for you, you don't want to put the dressing on, that's all right. Wash it, cut it up. Put in the dehydrator on these sheets, or you don't even need the sheets if you're just dehydrating the leaves alone. When they come out, just take it, put it in your blender, power the blender on high, and then that'll turn into a green powder. And then you could have your own source of green powder, you know, for the summer or for the winter or for when you travel. So once this is done, how we're going to store this, you could store this in some kind of like Ziploc bag, but they don't make a really good air seal. And I like to store my stuff in glass anyways. So we're just going to go ahead and take these guys and just uh, drop it right in. Now it's important to make sure that these are completely dry. You want to be able to break them. They want to be able to, um, you know, basically crunch and not be moist in the middle. That's a determination factor. You know, if I did all single layer or single file line, they would be all dry like this one is here. But because some of them were stacked up, uh, three up, they're not completely, uh, they may not be completely dry. Once you have them dehydrated in this state, you know, you can store them in the jar. Make sure the jar is tightly sealed. Easily store this stuff six months. But I bet you that this stuff will not even last 60 days in your house. Once you start eating this, it's like opening a bag of potato chips. If I was to open a bag of potato chips, which I don't, I'd probably eat one chip and eat the whole bag. And if I opened up this container of kale chips or collard chips, I'll open it up and eat them all. So yeah, this is just yet another way you guys could get more food that you grew in your garden. You know, in, in these ones I have my greens, I have my onions, I have my peppers, I have my tomatoes, I have my sauerkrauts and, you know, more uh, cabbages, Apollo Napa cabbage and bok choy that I grew in the winter in here. It's an excellent way to get more of the food you grow into you, and that's what I simply want. Like, I don't want you guys to have a garden and have it to be one of those ornamental beauty gardens and have it look really nice, right? I want it to be a functional garden that you guys eat out of each and every day of your life. And even if it's not like a lot, I want you guys to eat like one thing, even if it's just like a sprig of mint in your smoothie that morning. I want you to eat one thing out of your garden each and every day. And over time, increase the amount of things that you're eating out of your garden and decrease the amount of things you're having to buy. This is only going to be better for you as well as the health of the planet because it's a lot more, you know, uh, green <laughs> to be growing your greens instead of buying them. So if you guys enjoyed this episode, hey, please give me a thumbs up to let me know. That will encourage me to make more videos on how I prepare my foods. Maybe the upcoming ones may be on uh, blended salads. That's a fun one. Or actually, one of my favorites, the blended soups. Or uh, just uh, fresh soups. Maybe even uh, green smoothies. Those are just really easy ways. I like to use a lot of my greens and produce. I mean, of course, I eat a lot of this stuff fresh and make some amazing salads. Maybe that will be another good video. But yeah, thumbs up if you want more of those videos. Also, be sure to check my playlist that I'll put a link down in the description of this video to other videos I've made on how I prepare the food that I grow at home. Also, be sure to check my past episodes. I have over 1,100 episodes now. Share with you guys all aspects on how you guys can grow your own food at home and be successful at it. And be sure to click that subscribe button right down below to be notified of my new and upcoming episodes I have coming out about every three to four days. And while you're at it, 
be sure to share this video with somebody that you know that grows a lot of greens, but they don't use them. This is an excellent way to do that. Do it, and they taste delicious. Mm. So once again, this is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. We'll see you next time, and until then, remember, keep on growing. All right, this is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. Bit of another exciting episode for you. And what we're going to do today is give you guys an update in my garden here. Springtime, weather's beautiful. Try to get out early in the morning to the garden. Want some kale chips? Even Oakley likes kale chips. <laughs> Oakley loves my kale chips, and you will too, so go ahead and make them. <laughs>